Lately it feels like a lot of great shows are being canceled prematurely and it got me thinking how many great shows have been canceled after airing for only one season. So here is my completely subjective list based on my personal experiences. I apologize if I overlooked some awesome shows but chances are I just never saw them or maybe I have and I thought they were crap. In any event here it is my top 10 one season shows. <laughs> Kicking off the list at number 10 is The Tick. The 2001 live action version starring David Putty, I mean Patrick Warburton, as the big blue bug of justice himself. The short-lived series had writers from the animated show and even the Tick's creator, Bed Edlin, working on it and thus carried over the same style of humor that made the cartoon great, albeit with a little bit more adult-centered humor brought in. Back in bed with the CIA, huh? You certainly do your best work undercover. But what else can I say? It's the Tick. If you like the cartoon, you'll probably like the show. It spanned nine episodes before it was canned, so why was it canceled so soon? Well, the same old excuses. Bad time slot, lack of advertising, blah blah blah, people are stupid. Next! Knock it off! Number 9. Freaks and Geeks. It's your standard 80s coming of age show with over the top cliched characters and cheesy lines. In other words, very authentic to the 80s, or at least 80s movies. The writing for the show was pretty good, but what really carried it was its excellent cast lineup, including James Franco, Seth Rogen, Jason Segel, Ben Foster as a special needs kid, and even Biff as, well, an older Biff. The dad is just awesome, too, with his daily lectures. I had a friend that used to smoke. You know what he's doing now? He's dead. You know, there was a girl in our school... She had premarital sex. You know what she did on graduation day? Die! I would go, Ironically enough, I, I never saw the show when it first came engaged. out because I myself was a freshman in high school that year and busy doing freshman stuff, I guess. In any event, it's a pretty good show and thus made it onto the list. I hate this guy. Number 8. I was about nine years old when Nightmare Cafe first appeared on the NBC Friday Night lineup. I was instantly hooked in by its plot and dark tone, but mostly by its main star, the always entertaining Robert England, best known for his role in Knight Rider. Just like Miss Bennett's 1015. Let's see, Michael Knight, Foundation for Law and Government. You got it. She's expecting me. Oh, very quick, Mr. Knight. We're all expecting you. Oh yeah, and those Freddy movies too. Get out of here now! Please. Hey, you forgot the power glove. What's your drone? In the first episode, we're introduced to Frank and Faye, two strangers who we soon discover have recently died. They take refuge in a mysterious all-night cafe, where they soon become its two newest employees. With the help of Blackie, the owner of the cafe, they bring help or misery to the troubled souls that wander into its doors. Nightmare Cafe could best be described as a fantasy island meets Twilight Zone and had an affair with Nightmare on Elm Street type of show. It lasted a whopping six episodes, which along with the next show, make it the shortest on my list. Number 7. The school lunch programs. I only had a chance to watch one episode of this awesome show back during its original run in 1996. But the Dana Carvey show has proven to be well ahead of its time. Of course, I watched it just to see Dana Carvey, who I was a big fan of at the time. But many of the show's comedians and writers have since become famous, like Stephen Colbert, Stephen Carell, and Louis C.K. The show was full of over-the-top, lewd comedy with lots of political lampooning and was cut way too abruptly. ABC definitely dropped the ball on this one, and if you haven't seen it, definitely go check it out. Still beating heart of an illegal immigrant. Number 6. Top Cat. Top Cat has proven to be one of my absolute favorite classic cartoon shows. And with 30 episodes to watch, it really doesn't feel constrained by only being one season long. If you've never seen it, the show centers around a gang of New York alley cats, led by their cunning, manipulative, smooth-talking leader, Top Cat, or as his friends call him, TC, providing it's with dignity. Many of the episodes use the same formula for its setup, mainly with TC trying to invent new ways to make a quick buck without actually working for it. 
<laughs> so do I hear any suggestions as how to promote some fresh capital? Yeah, TC, like, uh, why don't we all get jobs? Sit down, spook. Anyone with something sensible to say? Another recurring theme has TC answering Officer Dibble's phone against his authority, but he always finds a way to talk his way out of getting penalized for it. It's headquarters, Dibble. They're getting wise. I can't keep covering up for you. Both the voice actors and the writers did a really great job on the show. My favorite character, aside from TC, of course, is Spook who's a cool-talking beatnik that excessively uses the word like when he talks. But Top Cat Baby, like, uh, that's against the law. My... I did, TC! Benny the Ball is also great as the cute, soft-spoken sidekick to TC, and, oddly, the only member of the gang that has no sclera in his eyes. Just pupils. He should probably get a doctor to check that out. Number 5. Crusoe, a romantic comedy drama about two men stranded on a desert island. Hmm, well okay, maybe in hindsight a better marketing team could have helped, but it was a good show. No, seriously, it was. Far from perfect, but entertaining, and, well, I enjoyed it. Obviously inspired by the novel by Daniel Defoe, the show took that story and put their own little spin on it. Well, actually, more like a really big spin that gives you a migraine, but it, it worked, kind of. Now, I can't really tell you much about the intricate plot without spoiling it for you, but... Basically, Crusoe is shipwrecked on an island along with his companion Friday, and although Crusoe lives in a treehouse that puts his home back in England to shame, he nevertheless desires to return home to his family. Now, the show had a massive production and had many Pirate of the Caribbean style humor and scenes thrown in there, and it's worth checking out. So yeah, go check it out. <laughs> Number 4. I don't even remember how or when I first saw this show, but for years I couldn't remember the name of it. I did, however, remember the little pocket watch thing with the globe in it, and eventually rediscovered Voyagers. Now, long before there was Quantum Leap, Phineas Bogg and Jeffrey Jones were traveling through time, but rather than putting right what once went wrong, they were putting right what once went right. Yeah, it's kind of strange. I'll let Phineas explain. When the army's red, it means history's wrong. Our job is to get everything back on track. You see, when the Omni's red, it means history is wrong. Wait, what? Okay, so the show's premise doesn't make any sense. You see, Phineas is a voyager, a member of an elite society of time travelers, and after his Omni, that little pocket watch thing, malfunctions, he ends up in Jeffrey's apartment, and the two venture off together, traveling through time. Now, rather than quantum leaping, these two fall from the sky. And rather than saying, oh boy, Phineas says, Bat's breath. Phineas Bach. Now, Phineas is quite the ladies' man, and Jeffrey is quite the cock blocker. But they complement each other pretty well. The show is incredibly cheesy, has horrible acting, and is riddled with plot holes. Like how all the people in history speak perfect English. We have Patra? Yes? I loathe Egypt. It's hot and it's dusty. But I have always loved sailing on the Nile. Maybe the Omni translates their voices and interprets other people's voices. Who knows? Still, Voyagers holds a very special place in my heart as one of the first science fiction shows I can ever recall seeing. So if you like cheesy sci-fi shows from the early 80s, this is definitely a show worth checking out. Any closing remarks, Jeffrey? Take a voyage down to your public library. It's all in books. Number three. Okay, so I already know what you're thinking. Planet of the Apes, the show? Have you completely lost your mind, Brian? But I tell you, this show was freaking great. A hundred times better than any of the sequels. Now, the original Planet of the Apes is one of my favorite movies, and Charlton Heston, one of my favorite actors of all time. Now, although Charlton didn't reprise his role, we do see Roddy McDowell return as the sympathetic Galen. Ron Harper and James Naughton star as the two new humans. Together with Galen, the three quickly become fugitives of the state and wander around trying to make the best of a bad situation. You know, by realizing there's no chance of ever returning home and that the human race is used for nothing more than target practice, manual labor, and fluffers and monkey porno. The costumes are just as ridiculous as the ones in the movies, but honestly, special effects aren't really that important to me, so too bad, it's on my list. Number 2 
so it's only it's not often that I get completely sucked into a show anymore, but Awake did just that. I remember being intrigued by the previews for it, and after watching the first season, I can definitely say it's one of the best shows on since 24. Jason Isaac does a fantastic job playing police detective Michael Britton, and he recently survived a car accident in which his wife or son were killed. Yes, wife or son. You see, in one reality, his wife survived and his son was killed, but when he falls asleep, he enters a different reality where his son survived and his wife was killed. Does it make any sense? No. Does it need to? Not really. His partner in one reality is played by Steve Harris, and in the other reality, by Fez from that 70s show. As he pieces together clues from one crime in one reality, they help him solve a parallel crime in another reality. And I don't know, it just works, and I'm truly pissed NBC canceled this one. Number 1 And the number one show, as if you even had to guess, Firefly! Yes, Joss Whedon's Space Western tops my list as the number one best one-season show. I mean, come on, you have everything. Great storyline, great cast, hilarious scripts, and it takes place aboard a futuristic spacecraft with a bunch of outlaws doing various illegal jobs to get money and food. Every character in the series brings something to the show as well, which is a hard thing to pull when you have as many main characters as this show had. If you haven't seen it, then go get it now. You won't regret it. Fox really screwed up big time on this one, but at least we got a feature film out of it, which is more than I can say for other canceled shows. If I missed any great one-season shows that you know of, be sure to list them in the comments. And as always, thanks for watching. Now,